Hey everybody, hey how's it going? So I've been messing around with this for like an hour or so before I started streaming just now. And I think it's good. I like it. Yeah, it does sound like Ryoji Ikeda. I, uh, I watched a couple performances of his and uh, I... I a friend who has composed at least one piece which is sort of in the style of and I just think it sounds fantastic so I think I've been influenced by Ikeda recently which is fine I guess
Uh, I, I don't think this has much of a form. I think it's kind of formless. It's just, uh, like seven or eight patterns doing stuff. Uh, I, I'm thinking eventually I will, uh, you know, come up with like a change where some of the patterns change, some of them stop. Maybe I start some new ones. You know, for example, if I stop, uh, this one. It becomes kind of sparse and sort of lose lose a sense of structure. Hey, Dr. Laserclaw. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I feel like I, I'm probably not the right person to talk about class structure. Uh, I mean, are you talking about, um, things like inheritance and... Yeah, I, I uh... I mean, I I, uh, I know a thing or two, but that seems might that might be a little bit too deep for me to uh, talk about with any meaning. I one thing I I was thinking about doing is um, making a tutorial on writing your own classes and methods, but uh, I don't know if that's what you're talking about.
yeah, it's on my list of stuff to do. Uh, I think one of my earlier streams I showed, uh, was it like, um, well, actually it's, it's in this code. It's, uh, this method called make buff dict and it takes a path name and it turns it, it, it returns a dictionary of sound files that have been read into buffers. And yeah, so that, that's that's fairly useful, and you know I can, you know I have the uh, code in my class library. Is that the kind of stuff you're talking about? Because I can I can dedicate a stream to that probably. In fact, I actually want to modify that make buff dict method. And as far as um, constructing applications. I, uh, I don't know, um, I have to think about that. I mean, usually I just have sort of a, a single superglider file or maybe a few files in like a folder. And I don't know if that constitutes an application. Cool. Okay. Well, that's good. It's good to hear. I will, I'll make a note of that and, uh, I'll try to make a priority of making that tutorial or showing it on stream or something. Uh, I both. I Casey, I'm. It's theoretically for a new piece, but I'm also just messing around. Uh. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking of this as like a section, or, or some sort of texture that I'll build my way into. And have a bunch of other sections. I I'm. It's going to be a piece for uh, uh, electronic wind controller. Um, so, you know, treating it like a, you, know, you play it like a clarinet or saxophone or something, but it's, it sends MIDI. And so the you know, supervisor is going to be making all the sounds. So there'd be some sort of solo instrument, solo sound controlled by a wind controller over this. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, Gonna make a uh, sort of pattern that plays like a very minimal melody. So I, I'm just messing around at the beginning. I'll, I have I have sort of a tempo clock patterns demonstration walkthrough planned. I just want to make like one more, one or two more, or two more things. Oh, that's not how you set the quant. That's how you get the quant. That's why I wasn't starting on a downbeat. This should work.
Uh, I forget how this synth dev works. Where's my filter? Not freak, it's LPF. I am the most indecisive when I try to come up with naming schemes. I just... <laughs> Every time I try to do something new, I think, oh, what am I going to call that? And then I'll change my mind like seven times, and then I can never remember. And I... Let's see if this is what I wanted. Triangle wave. Wait, what am I doing? Do it this way. C2. Oh, it's not. Let's see, here's how I get, I get screwed up. So I just start changing, changing names because I think it'll be easier, but then I forget them and then I. Uh, we'll stick with what it says. I made my bed and now I have to sleep in it. That's the rule. Okay, so I wanted this.
Yeah, crazy. What you're describing, if I understand it correctly, um, 
I mean, on, on the server, the, the greater than or less than operator can't act like a trigger because it, it just returns a zero or a one, which can be used to, you know, open gates on envelopes and stuff. I think, it, I mean, it certainly could be done. Uh, I don't know, it might, might not be trivial the way I currently have things set up here. Uh, okay, yeah, I was just stopping everything. I don't know. That's what you're talking about. That was fun. Uh, do you guys want to talk about temple clock and patterns and stuff? Uh... My cheat sheet. I came prepared this time. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, a couple streams earlier, uh, some people asked about Temple Clock, and I stumbled my way through it, and I realized I should really, uh, learn how Temple Clock works. And, um, I think I understand it a little bit better now. Um, if I can, uh, I realize that's probably obscured by the um, chat. See if we can embed this somewhere. Right, so, so tempo clock is basically sort of a scheduler slash metronome. It counts and it thinks in terms of beats instead of seconds. And um, I'm going to start just by making one. There we go. We made one. We made a tempo clock. Lesson over. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, you can check to see the current beat of the tempo clock you made with t.beats. So, at the time when I evaluated that code, the tempo clock t was on beat 15. 8875543 four, 463 whatever 
you know, so it was almost to the 16th beat. And now it's, oh, look at that. I almost hit it right on beat 30. So you can just keep evaluating t.beats, and you can see that the tempo clock is counting around, uh, is, is counting in the background. And you can stop a clock, a tempo clock, with t.stop. And once you do that, t.beats doesn't work anymore. Right. Clock is not running. <clears throat> if you make a new tempo clock, again, now it's counting, starting from zero once again. Um, if you press command period, as I just did, that will stop uh, a tempo clock dot new if you create it like this. It's gonna it's gonna stop that. So we, we can't check the beats anymore. So we press command period and to show that again, I can you know we got beats here. And then if we press command period using the language, and then t.beats doesn't work. But you can change the permanence of a tempo clock uh by uh, t dot permanent and by default it's false <clears throat> uh but you can change that by setting that attribute equal to true so now we can check beats we're on beat 21 22 and if we hit stop or press command period it's still counting just fine. So it, uh, the phrase is tempo clock survives command period. Of course, we can always stop it manually and then it's done, not running anymore. And you can also string these together onto a single line like this. And then as you create that and set it, you can see it has in fact been true, so it is permanent, command period, which I'm pressing has no effect. So here's how you, um, I'm gonna, I like them false by default because you can always press command period and just start over. So uh, scheduling, there are two primary methods for scheduling. I, I think there are two primary methods and they are uh, sked and sked abs. Where are they? Yeah, these two. Here's sked abs and sked. And let's start with sked, which is a relative time in beats. That's the first argument. So if I say something like five comma and then we want to give it a function to be scheduled, to, to be evaluated when it's scheduled. So if we say hello, dot post ln, and let's see, t dot beats. Okay, so it's running. Remember, sked is a a relative scheduler. So if we evaluate this, then five beats later, we see hello in the post window. And we can do it again, and exactly five beats, that's when we see it. And sked abs is an absolute time in beats. Now beat five has already happened. So if we do this, I think what's gonna happen is the tempo clock is gonna realize that absolute beat five has happened a long time ago because we're now on beat 104. And uh, so it's just gonna schedule it immediately. Right, there we go. But let's see, so we're on beat 114. So let's schedule this for beat 130. There we go. And now we can sort of monitor our beats. Getting closer to 130. So, and there it is. On beat 130, we saw hello.postLN. Interesting uh, and really convenient, once you get the hang of it, design feature of the scheduler functions is that if the function returns 
a number. Right, so this this function, if I sort of excerpt this briefly, you can see if without the one, when it's evaluated, it returns hello, the string, because that's what postln does. It returns its receiver. It's the last item in the function. But if we uh, semicolon one, so you know we could alternatively write it like this, if that's you know clearer then this function will post hello, but it actually returns the value one. So we can say something like, you know, x equals, and x is now the value of the function, which is one. So if a function like that returns a number, that function gets rescheduled uh, that many beats later. So we're gonna schedule hello five beats from now, and once it's scheduled, it gets rescheduled every one beat. And to unschedule this, well, you know, we didn't really store this function anywhere. It's, it's on the scheduler. Probably the simplest thing to do right now is just clear the temple clock, and that just uh, wipes all of the scheduled items out of the, the queue. Right, so now it's just this array, which is a one. I don't know what the one means, but if we schedule something and then check the queue, we can see that there's stuff in it, right? And it's being rescheduled every beat, and so we'll go ahead and clear it. And this this uh, this works for sched abs as well. We were to schedule this on beat 270 and end it with a one. Oops, am I going to make it? Yeah, so we scheduled that on beat 270 and it's now being rescheduled every one beat. So uh, a better way to... Um, to uh, reschedule, or to, to sort of manage unscheduling rescheduled functions rather than just t.clear, which stops everything, um, is to, you know, give your, give your function a name or something. So we say, hello, post ln, semicolon one. That's our function. Then we can say t, let's see, is it, is it running? Yeah, it's still running. I didn't hit command period. So t.sched. Four seconds from now, uh, that function. Now this looks like it's going to work, but uh, I don't think it will. If we then try to say, you know, re redefine tilde f. Okay, so the function tilde f has been scheduled, and if we say, okay, now this function is, you know, nil or or nothing, it doesn't actually work. Even though f is now this function, which when evaluated does nothing, uh, it's because when we scheduled it with t.sched, uh, that you know that we were using that for the actual function itself, and the stuff inside of it was was you know I, I I have a hard time explaining this, but if I show you the correct way to do it, it might make more sense. So uh, what we want to do is well first let's clear q. And instead of, so we make our function here, and instead of just putting tilde f, we want to make a function here and say tilde f dot value. Because now, when we evaluate this line, the interpreter doesn't actually know what's inside this function. It just knows that it's a function. Right? And when it's scheduled, that's when it actually evaluates the contents. So if we do this, and then this, four beats later, we'll start seeing hello. And now, if we redefine the function tilde f as a function which does not return a number, it gets unscheduled. So that's sort of a cute trick that you can use to manually unschedule specific items which are in the tempo clock's queue, rather than having to do t clear, which gets, gets rid of everything. So yeah, the first argument of T, let's let's uh, stop this for a second. Stop. Okay. So the first argument for new, as I think I went over in the last stream, is a tempo in beats uh, 
per second. So the default value is one, which means one beat per second, which is equivalent to 60 beats per minute, which is why we saw hello every one second. Because in that case, the, with the default value of one beats equal seconds, one beat is one second. Um, so two would be 120 beats per minute. This would be 180 beats per minute. And something like, uh, you know, 108 over 60, that is 108 beats per minute, or 1.8 beats per second. So now if I, you can see it's counting a little bit faster. And if I were to do something crazy, like 3,000 beats per minute, you can see that it's just sort of skyrocketing, right? We're just counting beats like crazy. Okay, so, so here's, here's some interesting things you can print, useful things about tempo clock. We know beats. So um, if we want to see the most recent beat that happened, right? These are fractional beats. We can see that, you know, if I evaluate t.beats, the last beat to occur was beat 36, and we happen to be about 37% of the way through it when we evaluate that. But we can use the floor method to round a floating point number down to the nearest integer. So even if it's like, you know, uh, 36.9, it'll become 36. So when we evaluate this, what we're getting uh, returned to us is the most recent beat that occurred. And we can even sort of evaluate these together just for clarity. I'm just... Uh, ending with an empty string so that it's uh if I don't do that then we'll get the last thing twice which I think is a little confusing so just an empty string here uh so yeah when I evaluated that we were on beat 122 and about nine tenths of the way through that beat so the most recent beat to actually occur was 122. Uh, you can change the tempo dynamically yes um, you can access it with t.tempo Right now, our tempo is 1.8, which we got from 108 over 60. And uh, we can just set that to some new value. And now, yeah, it's counting at 300 beats per minute. And then if we set this back to, you know, uh, one beat per second or 60 beats per minute, so if it's 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, right? There is a good way to actually, instead of having to do this manually, actually have the, you can schedule post LN commands on the tempo clock so that the post window sort of becomes like a visual metronome, which I'll get to just real quickly. So, so right, stop, make that again. So, right, this is how you see the, um, last beat that occurred and of course you can use seal short for sealing to show the next beat that's going to occur it rounds up to the nearest integer and if you want to see the um you know so with t.beats.postln uh if you just want to see how far you are within a uh, a single measure regardless of which beat actually occurred, you can use t.beat in bar. And this is sort of a modulo operator. You can see that, uh, so the last, the, the current beat is 84.5, and 84 is a multiple of four. That's the number of beats per bar. And there's, by default, there are four beats per bar. And uh, so here we, we had just hit a downbeat. This is a multiple of four. So we're on beat 0.5. Right? We're, we're between the, the downbeat and the next beat. Right here, uh, 136 is a multiple of four. So 137 is a, a beat two. And so we've, we've uh, hit the second beat and we're about halfway towards the third beat. So yeah, 
Uh, let's see what else. We can get the uh, the most recent bar. This t dot bar. Uh, dot post ln. And the way I, I think the way this is calculated internally is that uh, the the t dot beats is just sort of round rounded back rounded down to the nearest multiple of four and then divided by the number of beats per bar yeah so you can you can get the most recent bar in a value in beats by multiplying t dot bar by t dot beats per bar and this gives you the most recent uh, downbeat, the most recent, you know, beat one in a measure. So basically it rounds it back to the uh, nearest multiple of four. Uh, some other methods that are useful. Uh, you, so there's, there's t.bar, which we just saw, and t.nextbar. Which is a little bit weird to me because t dot bar is a value in bars, but t dot next bar gives you the next. Yeah, it's a value in beats, so we can do t dot bar times four. So now we can see a value in beats which corresponds to the last downbeat and the next downbeat. And when I say last, I mean most recent downbeat. So most recent downbeat was 392, 396. So here's we put some of those together. Uh, so let's make a function. So let's let's uh, let's we're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna schedule a function on this temple clock, which will post beat and bar information to the post window. And so we're gonna schedule this on the next bar. So instead of a value here, you know, we were doing, we were checking t.beats and sort of saying, uh, okay, let's do this on like 470 or something. We're just going to say t.nextbar. And that gives us a value, right, the next, the next bar which is available to us. And then a function. And we'll put something in there. And we're going to make our function separately as we did up here. So we'll call this post info. And let's see, we're gonna say beat, current beat is uh, b.beats.floor uh, mod uh, dot beats per bar and so this gives us the most recent beat which occurred and I think there's, there's multiple ways to do this using the the various methods but this is the way that I'm doing it here so remember t dot beats dot floor is going to give us the most recent beat which occurred and if we mod that by beats per bar which is four we get uh, you know, we're, we're basically just wrapping those values between 0 and 4. So when we have a downbeat, we have 0, and we have beats 1, 2, and 3. And if we want, we can add 1 to make it more human-readable. So yeah, so uh, So that is that, and we'll also post beat information. Sorry, bar information. We already did beat information. Bar information. Uh, and this is just going to be t dot bar. I think that's simple enough. So we can see the current beat number where one is the downbeat instead of zero. 
and how many bars have elapsed. And and we will maybe just post a new line just for clarity. And we're going to return the number one because this means this gets rescheduled every one beat. So we make that function, and then we do here is we say post info dot value, and I think that's all we need to do. So yeah, it waits for the next bar, and then starts putting this information in the post window. Bar two o two, three two three four. Etc. And if we change the tempo, uh, we can see the changes get reflected like immediately. So now it's 180 beats per minute. Now it's 70 beats per minute. And we could change this to uh, post. Uh, we can we can have it tick sixteenth notes instead of quarter notes. And what we would do there is we can't. I think if we change this just to be rescheduled every uh, quarter of a beat. Yeah, it's 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 doing a rounding thing, so it's just giving us. It's not exactly the correct beat. So I think what we need to do here is not floor it. Um, and take this stuff here and round it to the nearest 0.25. Let's see if that works. So we reevaluate this function. Yeah. So now it's counting 16th notes and again we'll change the tempo to say 140 okay so let's go ahead and say post info equals an empty function, turn that off, maybe set this back to 108, nice easy tempo. It's not exactly the same, crazy. It's uh, when we're talking about tempo clock, 0.25 is a value in beats, so it's dependent on tempo. But in a, in a routine, I think routines by default will run on, well, it's either system clock, or I think it's system clock. And system clock only thinks in terms of seconds. So a value of 0.25 means 0.25 seconds. That's my understanding, anyway. Uh, let's see, another, okay, so another interesting method here is next time on grid. And you might think that this is the same as p dot beats. Let's see. Post ln. Post ln. Uh, or you know t dot beats dot seal. The rounding up to the next beat. Uh, and it's not post lnning because I forgot to put post ln. Yeah. So initially you might think why do we have next time on grid if we can just do t.beats.seal or t. Dot, is next beat a thing? I don't even know. I wonder if this works. Uh no. <laughs> is this not I guess that's not a method. Next beat, but it said I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. Okay, I guess it's not, but that's, you know, I did, my point is, these seem to do the same thing, but next time on grid is a little bit fancier than that. 
So next time on grid, it takes two arguments, quant and phase. And uh, quant, you can think of as like quantization in a DAW, uh, you know, where you're quantizing to some value in beats, right? So one means beat, it's gonna, and, and that's the default. So if we say, you know, let's, let's look at just t.beats and t.next time on grid. So by default, it's quantizing next time on grid to the nearest beat. Um, of course, it has to happen in the future, right? Even if we're closer to the beat that just happened, it's always going to give us the next time on grid, which is quantized to that value. So if we set that uh, first argument, quant, uh, to a value of 4, then it gives us the next multiple of 4, which is the next downbeat, because we have 4 beats per bar right so we're always getting the next multiple of four and we could do something like give us the next uh you know multiply that by four so that we actually have quantizing to 16 and that'll give us the next bar uh you know basically every 16 beats so you know if you're thinking in terms of sort of song structure and you have something which is four measures long or eight measures long you know, you want to know when when is the next set of eight measures? And in this case, we're on beat 1391.3, and the next downbeat, whose beat number is a multiple of 16, or sorry, in this case, 32, right? we're doing 32 now, is 1408. And 1408 should be a multiple of 32, and it is, right? So that gives us, you know, or we can also quantize to the nearest... 16th note. And so now we can see that at beat 1444.56, blah, 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 the next 16th note, or the next, you know, one quarter of a beat is 144.75. So that's handy. And then that's the first argument, right, which is quant and then phase. And phase is an offset, right? So you can sort of quantize to a certain value and then shift ahead or behind by a certain number of beats. And I think phase, what is phase? Uh, phase is always supposed to be between, uh, I thought I saw it in here. Well, I th it's between zero, it's, it's greater than or equal to zero and less than the number of beats per bar. So, okay, so next time on grid without a phase, we're getting the next, Let's do the next uh, downbeat. All right, so now we can see the next downbeat. And if we do comma 1, it's going to give us the next downbeat plus 1 beat. So this is a good way of finding the next, in this case, beat 2. And if we think of the downbeat as beat 1, this will give us the next available beat 2. And let's see if I can uh, an example here. So... So it, what it's not going to do is find the next downbeat and then move ahead from that. Next time on grid with a quant of 4 and a phase of 1, uh, it might be the case that a downbeat has already happened, but we haven't gotten to beat 2 yet. It'll give us the next available time. So you can quantize to, um, you know, you, these in combination basically allow you to find any beat you want, and it'll give you the next one. So this is a handy method. Um, okay, so um, patterns. Uh, let's see if my uh, let's see, white noise amp 0.05 is still working. Yeah. That's 0.5. Uh, high pass filter. Make sure that's still working. Okay, so um, we know p-bind, or maybe we know p-bind, right? Okay. Instrument, uh, white noise, amp, 0 0.05, thus 0.2, and high pass filter, 5,000. And let's give this a name. We'll call it just p. And if we play this, uh, I think, well, let's manually set our delta time here. One second, right? 
And if we just play it like this, we can think of our door as a value in seconds. And I've, you know, been referring to it that way, definitely in my tutorials, um, which is not entirely true. Um, when you play a P bind, it gets scheduled on the uh, the default tempo clock. Right, so there exists a default tempo clock, which is permanent. So it's always there, and it's been counting for quite some time. Right, it's all the way up to four thousand whatever beats, um, and the tempo is one. So seconds equal beats. So that's why when we just play a P bind without specifying what clock it's scheduled on, we can just think of door as seconds when it's actually technically a value in beats. So uh, let's see. So that's that's P bind. So um, let's let's go ahead and and make this tempo clock right. This tempo clock T. Which is running at, let's make it, uh, yeah, 108 is fine. That's significantly faster than 60 beats per minute. And when we play a P bind, um, the first argument of play is a clock. And so if we play this on T, I think we're going to hear the actual little noise bursts be faster because, yeah, it's now playing on a tempo clock that I created which has a tempo of 108 beats per minute. And um, I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get my this stuff happening again. So we'll do this and you know, beats dot floor and we don't want to round that. And this is that going to work? Yeah. Okay. So now we've got beats being posted in the post window. So this this helps us visualize what's going on. So right, if we play this, let's let's make this a little bit louder and a little bit shorter so we can really hear the right. And I, what I'm trying to show here is that it's not in sync, at least not yet. See if I can make it sort of on off beats. Yeah, it just it just start, starts playing, um, and I think that's because the default quant value is zero, which means just ha start playing right away. Um, so I think if we say quant set that to one, maybe four, uh, it should start on the next downbeat. So on, on a beat one in the post dinner. Let's see if that works. No, I did the syntax wrong. And now it won't stop. Okay. Um, play pattern i think yeah it's uh, this i'm what i'm doing i'm i'm mixing syntax here we go back so we'll just say quant colon or this should work specifying that it's the third argument so we're going to skip over the second argument and do it this way so let's see there's our tempo clock might as well copy this and bring it down here so now if we start this up again so we can see our beats and bars. And if we play uh, this pattern, let's see. There we go. Yeah, I think you uh, when you actually, the, I think the problem is you can't do that. You can't do this because this returns an event stream player i think right yeah it's an event stream player and those i guess don't understand the quant message at that point it's already sort of creating i'm not entirely sure but i think 
being able to set the quant by appending it like that, that's for the proxy objects pdef and uh, pbindef and stuff. So, okay, so I, I guess a lot of people often prefer to use those proxy, proxy objects because you don't have to s maintain a bunch of environment variables like p. I mean, that's really, that's kind of sloppy. So uh, we can do pdef, and we'll call this, you know, the symbol p. And then this pdef is going to keep a reference to uh, this same pbind. We just need another parenthesis here. And then if we could say, we can say dot play, play this on the clock t, and uh, dot quantize it to the nearest beat multiple of four. Let's do this stuff. So I'm going to run this code somewhere in the middle of a measure, like here. That didn't work. Clear that. Um, let's try that again. Yeah. Nice. Starts on the uh, on the downbeat there. And uh, so if we do something like eight, uh, now it's it's going to start on not any old beat, but a beat which right is is the. Uh, one of every two beats. So I think it'll start on a multiple of two. So yeah, it was that was beat that was bar thirty six. Uh, so if I start this just after forty two, I don't think it'll start till forty four. Right, and if you set the quant to zero, it just starts. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there's there's something. Uh, it's part of it. I think is that it's already playing, and so so if we stop it and then set this quant, yeah, then it just starts immediately. Yeah, I, I, I've said this before. There must be a way to sort of play it and set the quant at once. And the syntax has always sort of eluded me. So, oh, okay, I push command period. So I'm going to clear this one more time. I mean, we can set the quant, you know, here, so just play on the next, you know, every four beats, whenever the next one of those comes around. So we can set it like that, and then we can, like, play it again here. So, see what happens here. Should start on bar 20. Yeah. Uh, does that not work? What's going on here? Well, whatever. They're all stopped anyway. Uh, use that for overlapping two sequences, like two p-binds. Yeah, uh, I will try to do that. Um, let's make these a little bit more distinct.
and we'll so here's what I'm going to do I'll make, make these be sort of um, just happen on downbeats so we're going to quantize this to the nearest downbeat let's see if this works Uh, up here. Uh, all right, I did it again. I, I forgot the underscore. The underscore is necessary. This means set the quant to four. And uh, this this is like meaningless here. Um, yeah, this this gets an attribute, and then the underscore actually sets that attribute to a new value. Uh, okay, so now this should start on bar twenty one. No. Oh, uh. All right, one more time here. So we've got we've got our tempo clock, and door four amp. Uh, release and play on that tempo clock and quantize it to downbeats. Then we can do another one. Call this Q. And we want these to be whole notes as well, but we want them to happen on a different beat. Like, um, you know, uh, these are all happening on beat one, so we'll put these on beat two. So uh, we'll make this be a different pitch. Um, something like. this and for the quant we specify an array where the first value in the array is the quant value and then the next one is the offset so this should happen on the next beat two and that didn't work what did I do wrong uh, Now it seems to work. Maybe there is some problem with playing it and quantizing it at the same time. Because I've had a lot of times, um, there's been a lot of times when I'll just do it a second time. Like I'll stop it and then do it a second time and then it works fine without changing anything. You know. And I think a lot of the help files do that as well in the examples, you know, the sort of, maybe this isn't the best one to demonstrate. Yeah, they'll, they'll sort of set the quant on a separate line uh, after it's already playing or, or before it's playing. So, uh, you know, I wonder if he, Reverse these. Let's do this. Yeah, I, it probably works either way. I'm not really exactly sure why it didn't work that first time, but uh, yeah, crazy. Does that answer your question? You can you can even schedule these at the same time. So if we Peta stop all those, um, so I think I should be able to just run this and. Even though I played them at the same time, 
they have quantization values that determine when they play on a specific measure and at a specific beat in that measure. Um, so if I were to set this to 0.5, then it would play on the AND of 1. Oops, uh, and we can do something like having the quantization values be the same, but having one be uh, uh, you know minus a sixteenth note. So this is uh, just one sixteenth note shy of a full measure. So these will sort of go out of phase with each other. Oh, yeah, they're, they're 1 25th of a beat going out of phase. That's not what I meant to do. I meant to do 1 point, is it what I mean to do? 1 over 4. I got 1 over 4 and point twenty five confused with each other because I can't decide if I want to use fractions or decimals. So, yeah, now... So you have a lot of power over when things happen and how they're quantized. Uh, and, um, there's another, um, object, uh, other than pdef that you can use, and that's, I think I have it here, right, pbindef. So, this is nearly the same thing as pdef. The difference is that it's it's like a pdef and it assumes you're going to have a pbind inside of it. So it prevents you from having to do a pbind instead of a pdef. So you can just do pbindf uh, and then just get rid of that and get rid of this extra parenthesis. And I guess this is sort of a slightly more attractive syntax. But um, yeah, if we just, again, it's really, it's exactly the same thing. And you can also schedule, you know, in addition to using dot quant to put them at a specific time on a tempo clock, you can also just use, um, uh, let's see, so going, you know, t dot sched abs, t dot next beat. Um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, we'll just do PC, do four of these, and we'll have the amp amplitude start at 0.2 and decrease and start at 0.4, decrease by half each time. And we'll just, we just quantize this to, uh, I mean, zero. And the but, but here we're sort of scheduling it in a, with a different strategy, you know, different different syntax here. So we're close that out, and this. So I now have two of those functions running simultaneously. I didn't mean to do that. So let's do this. And again, there we go. And this gives us our next next bar, not next beat. <laughs> next bear. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so I think we just evaluate this. 
didn't work because I didn't play it. Yeah. We can just run this whenever we want. We can sort of save this in a function or somewhere. And whenever we press it, we get this little 4 16th note thing on the next downbeat. X bar plus four. So now it actually waits an extra four beats. So that is basically what I've been doing here. We just sort of reset everything. Uh, same synth as, as last week. Nothing really new except for that white noise synth -def. And here's what I was messing around with today. This is the 26th, right? And right. So we have a tempo clock. I was doing 80 beats per minute. I made it permanent. It's counting away. And I start posting my metronome information because I like to be able to see it. And yeah, I just I just have this um I'm playing these glitch buffers, usually playing the one stored at index 42 because I like the way it sounds. And you know, some randomness. A lot of PW rand. I'm in a PW rand mood today. And so this just plays on my clock uh on the next downbeat. Oh yeah, I see. When when yeah, if you uh, if I quit the server while the um, meters are still open, it sometimes gets confused about node IDs because I have a reverb synth and it's uh, yeah. So okay, let's get get those back. There we go. Let's open this up as well and get that started again. So temple clock, post the info, and so yeah, 80 beats per minute. Yeah, every now and then it will pick randomly from the entire collection. We don't always get glitch number 42. Start those beeps. Do more beeps. I think it's seventy percent likely we get a beep. There's our beeps. And some white noise bursts. These happen. Yeah, I I could have done this with quantization. I could have had it start on uh you know, could have done like this sort of thing. Making because you'll always hear these somewhere on beat three, but instead I'm I'm actually using patterns to control the type of event, and what happens is we get these are all sixteenth notes right they're one quarter of a beat, and we get eight sixteenth notes, uh, and and on those sixteenth notes we generate rest events which just make it doesn't it's it's a rest right it's no synth, and then. On beat three, we get four sixteenth notes, which are note events, and that's when all these come into play. And then we end the last beat of the measure with another four sixteenth notes. So if you watch the uh, post window here, you'll notice that when we see a beat three, that's when we'll hear noise. And I can make it more likely by making the amplitude usually choose values that are not zero versus just four completely silent notes. So if I do this, and it's going to be somewhere on B3, but uh, 
three of those 16th notes are going to be zero, but one of them is going to make sound. So it could be on the one, the, the downbeat of, of beat three, or three E and uh, any of those 16th notes. And the sustain time of that white noise burst is also variable. It's uh, the duration of one beat, T dot beat door, which in this case is 0.75. Uh, so it could be half a beat, a quarter of a beat, an eighth of a beat, a twelfth of a beat, or a sixteenth. And sus, sus, uh, you know, that just gets plugged into the synth def and it's in an envelope, so it's a value in seconds. So we can't, you know, these are no longer beats, we actually have to con convert the beat value into a duration. And, yeah, so this is in seconds. Alright, so our sub oscillator. Let's see if it's gonna. It's like a. There it is. If you, any of you are listening at home on a laptop, you probably can't hear that. If you listen on headphones, you can probably hear it. Because I'm listening on headphones and I can hear it. So. Uh. A little bit more, a little bit more frequent subs, subtones. Come on. Don't make me do it. Ooh, yeah. This is a uh, little 16th note pattern whose amplitude will decay. Yeah. And this this one is just panning hard left, hard left, right, hard left, right. Uh, yeah, just minus one, positive one pan position forever. And each one can be at its normal rate or an octave down. And I guess I could change the, uh, I can make it pick from many different buffers. And then these, which are uh, eighth notes instead of sixteenth notes. Let me isolate those. Actually, uh, where's my PDF? Dot stop all. Here we go. See, that's I. I really. I like this. This is very handy because whenever you use a pdef or a pbind it gets stored in a dictionary or behind the scenes. It's this, uh, this identity dictionary, and if you say dot all dot do, it's going to iterate over everything, and you can just say each thing that you encounter in the identity dictionary, just stop it. So that's sort of a really convenient way to just stop all the uh, proxy patterns. So yeah, these.
Let's see, I like nine. Fourteen, I like that. All right, fourteen. Some of these sounds are just really quiet, I guess, at certain parts. Oh, okay. Nine, fourteen, and eighteen. Gonna stop that briefly. Uh, uh, and this one, let's actually make it happen some of the time. I have this one going straight to the speakers. Maybe I'll bring it. Just put everything through the reverb. Because who doesn't like reverb? Wait a minute. Those are sixteenth notes, aren't they? Why are they sixteenth notes? Uh these are Oh, it's because they're not 16th notes. It, I misled myself by naming it 16. Uh, it's 1 16th of a beat. So it's 64th notes. Yeah. But still, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can totally use GUI, but I, um, I'm in such an experimental stage of this that um, I, if I start building a GUI and then continue working on the piece, the the um, the things that I'm gonna want to do to these sounds are gonna change, and it's gonna render the GUI like out of date. And I'll have to change the GUI. And building a GUI is not a thing that you can do super fast in Super Collider, at least not for me. So I, I am perfectly happy working with text and just scrolling around and evaluating little things. But um, when I'm done, I will probably make a GUI. And I'll probably, you know, control it with like a MIDI controller or, or something. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I think of making, like making a GUI is like one of the last things I should do. I've, I've tried to make GUIs first and I just end up pixel hunting for like hours and instead of working on the sound, so. And it would be nice, but I'm just not, I'm not there yet, so. Um. Why, but why is this door one over eight? Why, and door one over 16? And it's, it sounds the same. It's got the same rhythm to it. Is this like an illusion thing? Like, is, what if I pan these? Centered. Yeah, it is an illusion. It's uh, it's it's sort of like one one ear is. It's like the echo or something. Hey, what is? Yeah. 
Because if it, if it alternates hard left and right... It actually sort of sounds like it's half the tempo. So this is interesting. What if we... What if we do like halfway in between? Just multiply this by 0.5. So... Or maybe like 0.5. Six or seven or something. Nope. Here we go. So it was just an illusion. Oh, what is happening here? I can't read my stupid post window. Uh, basic put in the cloud range. So that means. It's this one, right? Were you just not uh, seeing the the post window counting along? Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of it just you know you you start the tempo clock at some time and then depending on the number of beats per bar, every multiple of that number is considered a downbeat. So by the default, the default number of beats per bar is four, so every multiple of four is considered a downbeat. What is this wacky error message? Um. Oh wow. How did that happen? Good lord. I'm lucky nothing terrible happened. Yeah, that's what I wanted.
Ugh, okay. My neck is starting to hurt, so <laughs> I think I need to like stand up and stop streaming for a while. But I feel like I'm starting to see some significant progress here. I mean, I like the way this sounds. I think this will make an interesting sort of musical section if I sort of massage it the right way. As I massage my own neck. I think that'll be nice. Uh, I just got to come up with, I, mean, I want some, you know, more, this is a, not really thrilled with this wacky thing. This, this I just cooked up just on stream and I, that, I can do a lot better than that as far as interesting melodic things go, you know, and some chords and some just gently detuned things. And yeah, but I mean, this is, this is a lot of good stuff. I'm happy with this. And, um, you know, I'll probably keep working on this over the week. And I think I'll probably be back Wednesday next week. At some point I might have to sort of take a week off because you know, at the end of August, the fall semester starts, and I've got to start uh, nailing down syllabi and figuring out what I'm going to teach because some things have changed in the studios here. Do some remodeling. Anyway, that's uh, but I should be back. I should be back um, a week from today. Yeah, definitely. I I might I can see how you feel that way. I mean, it's I feel like some people would think the glitchy stuff is actually pretty happy because it's all rhythmic and bubbly and bouncy and fun. Uh, but I also like contrast in my music. I like to put you know, sort of nice melodic familiar tonal things r right on top of uglier weird stuff and time it right so that it's unexpected. Okay, so I'm going to get out of here. I hope I hope you all enjoyed watching the stream today. Hope it was uh sounded good, productive, useful, interesting. Hope you learned something. Um, yeah, okay, so signing off, I guess, and probably see you guys next week around the same time, around three in the afternoon or so, so take care.